be with you. Good morning. How's the, how's the PA system? Is it coming through? Can I get it a little closer? Is that good? Right there? All right, good. Our focus in worship today will be the uh, gospel lesson. Uh, the two disciples asked Jesus, they said, can you do whatever we, can you do whatever we, we ask you to do? That's, uh, you know something's coming that's probably not going to be good. Uh, that's the way it goes with humans. But, uh, anyway, it's, uh, that's, that's what we'll be looking at. Yeah, yeah. Moving on up is the theme. Moving on up, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in the sermon. As far as the order of service con is concerned, you see in your bulletin, it's all printed out for you, with one change. We're not going to do the Kyrie. The Kyrie is just simply a, uh, a, a it's a Greek and Latin term that, that means Lord. And, and it's when you call out to the Lord, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. But we're going to skip that and go right from the intro. It, which intro it just means entrance, the entrance prayer normally comes from the Psalms. And uh, we'll go from the intro, we'll go directly to the hymn of praise in, in our bulletin insert. So just so give you a heads up on that. And then the collect of the day. Collect, that's another term. It's a, a collect means a, a collective uh, theme, like a prayer that has a theme to it, kind of ties the whole uh, theme of worship together uh, and so forth. So that's it. That's enough of, uh, about the liturgy. Let's uh, begin our worship today as we sing our opening hymn, which is Come to Calvary's Holy Mountain, hymn 435. Is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. 
If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. So since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the actual body and blood of his son Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice on Good Friday that takes away your sins. The proof that God accepted that sacrifice is his resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. By the authority of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The intro, which can be found in your insert, and we will uh, speak it responsively. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From this evil and unjust man I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. For you have delivered my soul from death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man.
The reading from the Lutheran Confessions is uh, from what's called the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Again, that word apology, I spoke to you about this the last time I was with you, is not an apology in the sense of um, asking for forgiveness or taking it back. It's, it's actually the opposite of that. It, it means a defense. It's, and the apology is, in this writing, it's defending the uh, Augsburg Confession, which was the first public confession by Lutherans back in 1530. And the section that we're looking at is, uh, let me just uh, find it here real quick, I'm just taking a second to get it there. Uh, what is a sacrifice, the kinds of sacrifice? It's under that section. Um, and so it's talking about sacrifice, uh, and Jesus will talk about his sacrifice in the Gospel lesson. Uh, the book of Hebrews will also uh, mention it as well in our epistle reading for today. So, uh, beginning with uh, paragraph 53, and, and just again, why, why are we even discussing this? See, in the, uh, in the Roman Catholic faith, the idea is that when, when the Catholic Mass takes place and Holy Communion happens, the understanding in their theology is that the sacrament of the altar is a unbloody re-sacrifice of Christ. That, that it's a, it's a, it's, they're sacrificing Christ again uh, through, the, through the sacrament of the altar. And uh, Martin Luther had some strong words to say about that. He said that that's the chief abomination of the papacy. He had, well, Martin Luther had very strong words about, about, about that. He said, no, no, that's wrong. So here's what we're going to hear about this. Uh, and it's not specifically going to address the, the Mass, but that's what it's all about, the ma what the Mass is. It says, the main proofs for our belief are in the epistle to the Hebrews, yet the adversaries twist mutilated passages from this epistle against us as this very passage where it is said that every high priest is ordained to offer sacrifices for sins. Let me just pause here. They're saying, well... The Old Testament uh, priests, they, they offered lamb sacrifices repeatedly. So we're just repeating the sacrifice again and the sacrifice of the altar. That, that was the reasoning. That's what they mean when they say our adversaries. That's what they're thinking. And we Lutherans are saying, no, 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 no. That's, that's not correct. Scripture immediately adds that Christ is the high priest. The preceding, and then it has the text uh, there, uh, from Hebrews chapter 5, which is the text that we'll be hearing in just a few moments from the epistle. The preceding words speak about the Levitical priesthood and show that the Levitical priesthood was an image of Christ's priesthood. The Levitical sacrifices for sins did not merit forgiveness of sins before God. They were only an image of Christ's sacrifice, which was to be the one atoning sacrifice, as we said before. To a great extent, the epistle speaks about how the ancient priesthood and the ancient sacrifices were set up not to merit the forgiveness of sins before God or reconciliation, but only to illustrate the future sacrifice of Christ alone. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, saints had to be justified by faith, which receives the promise of the forgiveness of sins <coughs> granted for Christ's sake, just as saints are also justified in the New Testament. Let me just pause here. The, the belief is that the, the Jews of the Old Testament and the Christians of the New Testament are both saved by faith in Christ. The only difference is the Jews look forward to the Christ who was to come, and we, of course, we look back on Good Friday and Easter Sunday on the Christ who came. But the object of our faith is the same, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, continuing on, we're almost through. Uh, from the beginning of the world, all saints had to believe that Christ would be the promised offering and, and satisfaction for sins, as Isaiah 53.10 
preaches when his soul makes an offering for our sin. In the Old Testament, sacrifices did not merit reconciliation except as a picture for they merited civil re reconciliation. And by civil, he means um, civil in the sense of uh, society and, and uh, civil righteousness in society, but not righteousness before God, which is different. Uh, but they illustrated the coming sacrifice. This means that Christ is the only sacrifice applied on behalf of the sins of others. Therefore, in the New Testament, no sacrifice is left to be applied for the sins of others except the one sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. Those who imagine that Levitical sacrifices <coughs> merited the forgiveness of sins before God and by this example require sacrifices in the New Testament that are to be applied on behalf of others in addition to Christ's death are completely mistaken. This imagination absolutely destroys the merit of Christ's passion and the righteousness of faith, and it corrupts the doctrine of the Old and New Testaments. Instead of Christ, it makes for us other mediators and atonement makers out of the priests and sacrifices who daily sell their work in the churches. Uh, the sale of indulgences, for example. If anyone argues that in the New Testament a priest is needed to make offering for sins, this can only be said about Christ. The entire epistle to the Hebrews confirms this explanation. In addition to Christ's death, if we were to look for any other satisfaction that applies to the sins of others and so to reconcile God, this would be nothing more than to make other mediators in addition to Christ. So there is our confession, saying Christ alone is our salvation. We cannot bear it by any sacrifices of our own. So, good news there. Um, we continue with our uh, worship as we go to the scripture readings for today. And uh, there's a wonderful reading of uh, in the Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah, chapter 31, speaking of a new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them up by the hand to deliver them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. But they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who 
said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he, said also, as he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to say to them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand, or at my left, is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our <coughs> faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. You can find that printed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, he hath not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. 
Pilate. He, he suffered and was and buried. And, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Seated as we uh, sing our next hymn, My Song is Love Unknown in 430.
grace, mercy, and peace to you through Jesus Christ, our Lamb of God that takes away our sins. You remember the uh, television series? It goes back quite a few years ago. I think back in the 70s it came out, if I remember right. Um, called The Jeffersons. Anybody remember that? The Jeffersons? Remember that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, The Jeffersons. Yeah, my mother-in-law, uh, she, she always liked that. She, she always enjoyed that show. Um, it was based on a, an African-American family that made it big in business and could afford to move to a uh, deluxe apartment in a, a very expensive high-rise in the city. And the theme song had the words, we're moving on up. And Jesus is uh, moving on up too. Uh, he's uh, walking uh, from Jericho with his disciples and heading towards Jerusalem. It's quite a quite a long walk in those days. They were they were in good shape. They were physically fit. Those men of Jesus' time. And uh, as they're moving up to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's at a much higher elevation uh, than the land surrounding it. And and now for the third time in the Gospel according to Mark, uh, Jesus spells out clearly to his disciples that. He will be condemned and delivered up to the chief priests and the scribes, where he will be mocked and spit upon and flogged or whipped and killed, and he will rise again. Now, that's not the kind of moving on up that the disciples had in mind. Uh, not what they wanted to hear, especially uh, James and John, those two. For these sons of Zebedee, and for the other disciples, really what they were more interested in was moving on up in their future careers of presumed earthly glory. Perhaps James and John felt that they were entitled to special honorary privileges because they were part of that very select few who, for example, saw Jesus in his magnificent glory on the Mount of Transfiguration along with Peter, and since there's only a, a right hand and a left hand, only two positions, well, sorry, Peter, you're just going to have to fend for yourself. It's, it seems uh, so cutthroat and underhanded for James and John to be elbowing their way to the top. They had forgotten Jesus' wisdom when the Lord had said, why don't you repeat after me what the Lord said? For everyone... For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, they forgot that. They forgot that from, uh, from Jesus. And the other disciples were indignant. Maybe they were annoyed at themselves for not asking first. And like the rest of their self-promoting, self-centered sinners, they craved attention and recognition for their own accomplishments and, you know, like children vying for attention while shoving their siblings aside and yelling, hey, mom and dad, look at me. They're, they're totally self-absorbed. Pastors and congregations are not immune to this kind of thing. Our selfish and sinful natures want the glory, the authority, the power to control and manipulate outcomes in our favor. Some folks even resort to having secret meetings or distortions of the truth and sometimes downright lies to get what they want. It is as if the only thing that matters to them is that they get what they want regardless of the people who may get hurt along the way. But Jesus shows us how God intended us to be uh, among us when he says, and why don't you again repeat what Jesus says. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Jesus dismissed uh, James and John's request. It's not his to grant these positions to sit at his right and at his left in the kingdom of God, but only the Father's prerogative. The disciples will drink the cup. They will also suffer for proclaiming Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. According to tradition, 
most of the twelve apostles were martyred by stoning, stabbing, and even being crucified. Uh, James was the first to be killed by Herod Agrippa I in Acts chapter 12. And it is said that an attempt was made to kill John with poisoned wine. He died in exile for daring to preach Jesus. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said that they were. Did they know the violent hostility that would confront them? Did they know that they and future followers of Jesus would be beheaded, burned alive, tortured, devoured by lions, and drowned for taking up their cross? Did they know when, and let me change that, did you know that when you were baptized, that the world would despise you for bearing the name Christian when you were confirmed and made the promise to remain steadfast in the confession of the Apostles' Creed and the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and willing to suffer death rather than fall away from it, that some would label you as an ignorant, stupid, naive, Bible-believing, Midwest hick. Did you know that your confession of faith would exclude you from a world of fleshly delight, from unbridled sexual pursuits, and indulgence in whatever your heart desires, and fun, and sleeping in on Sundays, your conscience unburdened of any guilt whatsoever? It's not easy when the world uh, pits you against science for believing that God created the heavens and the earth instead of the theory of evolution as the explanation for our origins, it's not easy to stand up and say, I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman, particularly in our society where same-sex marriages have become the norm. It's not easy to publicly state your conviction that life begins at conception while most of our political leaders on both the national and state level deceitfully claim that killing a baby in the womb is, a, is compassionate health care. <sighs> we certainly have our own bitter cups to drink from as well. It's hard to choke down the dregs of illness and death, disappointment and heartache that inevitably find their way into our lives. It's hard, but not impossible. Even unbelievers suffer similarly, but you have something else. You have God's promises. You have what Jeremiah says in our Old Testament lesson for today, that is, the New Covenant where God says, and let's repeat what God says. Would you repeat after me? I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's what you have. You have that new covenant. What a blessed word from, from, our, from Jeremiah. Jesus makes that new covenant a reality by fulfilling his word spoken to his disciples and for us in our gospel lesson for today. And he does that in that in his word, he fulfills it when he says, and please repeat after me again, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Yeah, that's wonderful. Jesus moved steadfastly and determined toward the cross to save you. That is his service to you as God's suffering servant. Jesus enters Jerusalem, which Christians will celebrate a, a week from now on Palm Sunday. As your high priest, Jesus offers up the once and for all sacrifice for your sins and the sins of the whole world. And Jesus was born into the world on Christmas Day 
in order to be the Lamb of God that would lay down his life on Good Friday to be that sacrifice that secures your salvation. Our song is Love Unknown, we just sang, because we cannot fathom that kind of sacrificial love. Not fully. Uh, it's our finite human minds cannot fully, can, that love of God cannot fully penetrate because it's just beyond us. We cannot fully comprehend the kind of love that loves to the point of suffering God's wrath for our sin, all the sin of the world, cosmically focused on one poor, frail, broken human body, mocked, spit upon, flogged, nailed to a cross, lifted up and gasping for breath, unfairly, undeservedly, willingly, lovingly. It's a love our finite minds are incapable of full comprehension and understanding. Are you able to be baptized into the baptism with which he is baptized? I hope so, for in that baptism, Jesus baptizes you into his death, killing your sinful flesh. And that baptism baptizes you into his resurrection from the dead, giving you new life, the kind of new life that enables you to bear your cross of suffering here below before we enter his glory above. Well, speaking of bearing uh, the cross of suffering, the hymn writer Paul Gerhardt was no stranger to suffering. He lived in Germany in the mid-1600s, and during his career as pastor, he was witness to the plague and the slaughter during the Thirty Years' War. It was a relig religious war. Many, many people were killed. And he buried many, many people. I think I was told that in one month, he had 50 funerals. In Berlin, he found himself caught between Lutheran and Calvinist factions, unwilling to compromise his doctrinal stance that the Lord's body and blood are really present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. In Holy Communion, Calvin took a more symbolic view of the Lord's Supper, that the body and blood only uh, uh, are fi figurative, not literally there. He um, eventually lost his position there. He outlived his wife and all but one of his children, and he uh, wrote hymns of tremendous comfort and strength in a time of his grief. For example, why should cross and trial grieve me? Uh, our hymn number 756. And the motto on one portrait of Gerhardt reads, a theologian sifted in Satan's sieve. He certainly drank the cup of bitterness and yet always remained faithful in his love of God and hopeful in the promise of the resurrection. And similarly, I have witnessed uh, believers. Last week I conducted a funeral, and when I looked at the date of the deceased, I, I, I marveled at it because he was born on June 24th, 1952. Hmm, that's the same date as my one and only sister was born. So it was kind of close to home. And oh, wow, 71 years old. And, um, uh, you know, it's like, oh. And what was really, for me, a witness was uh, the father of the deceased. Uh, here he is at the age of 96, 97, and just the way he carried himself and, uh, and uh, just the strength of his faith and enduring the death of his son like that, uh, not, not a word of any kind of self-pity or... or typical sorrow, you know, where you say, well, parents are not supposed to bury their children. Well, of course not. That's, that's, that's what we say. But there was none of that. He, was just, he just had that rock-solid faith that just, oh, just blows me away. Uh, so, so thankful for saints like that that uh, encourage us, you know, as they undergo suffering and struggles and they, their faith keep, uh, brings them through. So, uh, so, you know, and that's the, and that, again, are you able to drink the cup that he drinks? Again, uh, I hope so, for he comes with, today, with a cup, uh, the cup, the chalice, and the cups of salvation and Holy Communion. He gives us his, uh, his blood for the forgiveness of sins, and through that means of grace, our faith is strengthened to be something like that 97-year-old guy that I was just talking about. 
So, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you, they said, but Jesus has taught us to pray. Uh, how did he teach us to pray? He said, not my will, but what? Your will be done. That's how we're supposed to pray. Yes, yes. And may God help us to pray in that way and uh, pray that uh, knowing that in his perfect love, even though we walk through the dark valley of the shadow of death, knowing that we need not fear any evil, for he is always with us, and that uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, we are, in effect, uh, moving on up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The uh, offerings will be gathered, and we'll uh, and we'll sing the uh, uh, the hymn. sins. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our worship continues with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we Lord and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. <coughs> Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 May we see it as we sing our closing hymn. 